Now, I've been asked to say a few words about neocons, because one of the theses is that uh, the neocons, the faction that dominates the current uh, Bush administration, has a proclivity to support terrorism, to approve it, to carry it out. Uh, they accuse various world religions of supporting terrorism, but it's actually the neocon doctrine on its own that includes endorsements of terrorism. This is Leo Strauss. Uh, I put he's the neocon pope. He is the ideological leader of the faction around Wolfowitz, Fife, Pearl, Luti, Woolsey, and many others, both inside and outside of government, who have been important in recent years. This is the neocon family tree, and there you see a group of, uh, of neocons down at the bottom. Many of those are in the government, some others are still in the private sector. Leo Strauss is their ideologue. In other words, this is an ideological faction, a very rare thing in American history. They say that they believe in an ideological point of view, and that's what keeps them together. The main influences on Leo Strauss, as I try to show, are Nietzsche, someone who has to be regarded as a precursor of fascism and Nazism, Heidegger, who was a card-carrying Nazi, and Carl Schmitt, also a card-carrying Nazi. Now let's just see a little bit about these people. This is Carl Schmitt. This is another one of the ideological gurus of today's neocons. He was the one who designed the emergency law provisions of the Weimar Republic that allowed Adolf Hitler to take power legally and then use the Reichstag fire to consolidate that power into a dictatorship. So this is somebody who believes in martial law, dictatorship, coups, and uh, the state of emergency as the way to rule. Now what does Leo Strauss have to say about terrorism? He doesn't talk about terrorism directly, but he talks about it in a kind of a general way. He says, he talks about something called the universal and homogeneous state. The universal and homogeneous state would be what most people would understand as a world of peace, progress, and prosperity a state where there is no particular war going on and social conflicts are minimized. Leo Strauss wrote, if the universal and homogeneous state is the goal of history, history is tragic. Its com completion will reveal that the human problem is insoluble, but there will always be men who will revolt against that universal homogeneous state. When the uh, Good Friday Accords were signed for Ireland, holding out the prospect for peace, when the uh, Palestinians and the Israelis signed the Oslo Accords, the neocons concluded that the possibility of conflict was going out of the world and that they had to do everything possible to make sure that conflict was kept going. Leo Strauss then says, those real men may be forced into a mere negation of the universal and homogeneous state, into a negation that is not enlightened by any positive goal, into a nihilistic negation. Now, nihilism, of course, means you don't believe in anything. Uh, in 19th and 20th century Europe, a nihilist is an anarchist bomb thrower, someone who's willing to kill uh, for the sake of killing. And what, therefore, one possible meaning of the nihilistic negation is terrorism. And what would the nihilist revolution look like? That nihilistic revolution, he writes, may be the only action on behalf of man's humanity the only great and noble deed that is possible once the universal and homogeneous state has become inevitable. The successful revolt would take us back to the primitive horde. Now, what's the primitive horde? He means the old stone age. He means the cavemen. He means the hunting and gathering and foraging societies. Now, this can cover literally anything. War, genocide, mayhem, murder, terrorism. And this is the written form of the belief of the most powerful faction in the United States government at the present time and the faction that has been most active in the wake of 9-11 and undoubtedly in the preparation of 9-11. Strauss's conclusion, workers and warriors of all countries unite while there is still time to prevent the coming of the realm of freedom. In other words, he doesn't want prosperity and a humane society. He wants a society dominated by war and by bloody political conflicts. This is from his book, On Tyranny, 1963. I would only say that the neocons are famous for 
preaching their true doctrines only verbally and only writing down a kind of watered down version of what they actually believe. So if this is the watered down version, I shudder to think what the verbal version is. One of the current neocons is Samuel Huntington. And it is my contention that the purpose of 9-11 is to unleash the scenario for a world war which is contained in this book, The Clash of Civilizations, Remaking of the World Order from 1995 approximately. What this says is that the Anglo-American, U.S., British world domination is challenged by two groups. One are the Arab and Islamic countries. They are a threat because of their high birth rate, not because of ideology, but because they are multiplying too fast from his point of view. The other challenger civilization is China, and China is a threat because of its high economic growth rate. So what Samuel Huntington recommends is that the West, the United States, must organize a coalition to deal with the Islamic world first and with China later on. So this is a perspective for endless war and indeed for the Third World War. A group of self-identified radical conservatives at the right-wing extreme of the Republican Party. A group of intellectuals and policymakers who saw the fall of the Soviet Union and communism not as an opportunity to scale back America's Cold War military machine, but as an opportunity to build up its size and scale, to use military force more aggressively and unilaterally, to construct a new, unchallenged American empire. It's this kind of ideology that has grown up in the wake of the Cold War, propounded quite openly by what we are calling neoconservatives in America. You know, so this is a, not just a Republican takeover, this is a very specific wing of the Republican Party. It's neoconservative, it's unilateralist, it doesn't believe in the rule of law, it doesn't believe you have to tell the public the truth. And they happen to be an extremely uh, arrogant, dangerous group of reactionary status. Uh, they're not conservatives. They have a political agenda with regards to foreign policy that they had been working on for years and years uh, and, and writing about this and, and, and saying this is the post-Cold War vision. This is our post-Cold War vision for American power. Ever since the Cold War ended, there were people who were fuming on the right, thinking this is the golden opportunity now that Russia's out of the way for America to take over the world. We're not doing anything about it. Those damn liberals, those soft heads, are keeping us from doing what is our godly mission. A radical plan for American military domination first surfaced during the administration of George H.W. Bush. In 1992, Paul Wolfowitz, working in the Department of Defense, was asked to write the first draft of a new national security strategy a document entitled The Defense Planning Guidance. The most controversial elements of what would later come to be known as the Wolfowitz Doctrine were that the United States should dramatically increase defense spending, that it should be willing to take preemptive military action, and that it should be willing to use military force unilaterally with or without allies. This new reliance on military force was necessary, according to Wolfowitz, to prevent the emergence of any future or potential rivals to American power, and to secure access to vital resources, especially Persian Gulf oil. In 2000, they would craft yet another proposed national security strategy, this one published by a right-wing think tank calling itself the project for the new American century. At its core, the document revived the Wolfowitz Doctrine, it called on the United States to increase the military budget by up to a hundred billion dollars, to deny other nations the use of outer space, and to adopt a more aggressive and unilateral foreign policy that would allow the United States to act offensively and preemptively in the world. The elimination of states like Iraq figured prominently in this grand vision. I understand that they want the American public to believe that the invasion of Iraq was the response to September 11th. I think it is a lie. I believe that it is part of a neoconservative agenda to assert that American hegemony is untouchable. And September 11th gave them the opportunity to put in play plans that they had been considering since the first Bush administration. 
in all of its previous incarnations, and long before 9-11 and the current war on terror. The Wolfowitz Doctrine had identified regime change in Iraq as a crucial first step toward global domination by force. In a widely circulated letter to President Bill Clinton in 1998, the members of the Project for the New American Century challenged the President to act forcefully and militarily to remove Saddam Hussein from power. Two years later, George W. Bush would handpick many of these same neoconservatives for key foreign policy posts in the Pentagon and State Department. Once installed in government positions, as recent interviews with a number of former members of the Bush administration have revealed, the group maintained its long-standing focus on Iraq, a focus that intensified after the attacks of September 11. In the meetings of the inner sanctum of the Bush administration, the attack on Iraq was brought up from almost the first days, even though there was no evidence whatever that the Iraqis had been involved in this.